again. Well, today's video is a little bit different, partly because I'm releasing it on a Friday. In the last month or two, I've tried to have something come out every Wednesday morning in the early hours. But looking at the calendar, I couldn't resist doing something for the Ides of March. 15th of March today, when this is going to be posted, and um, it's obviously famous from Shakespeare and obviously those who know a little bit more about the history for the date when Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC. Now, perhaps in the future, maybe next year or something like that, I'll do a talk on the conspiracy and the assassination and Brutus and Cassius, because there's lots of interesting stuff there, both the build-up to it, how successful it was. The Romans don't have that good a record on assassinating emperors later on, at least senators don't. Um, so this is one of the most successful senatorial conspiracies, though, of course, Julius Caesar wasn't an emperor, so it's all happened before that. But... Um, there's lots of stuff, there's lots to explain. Those sort of talks will need a little bit more preparation, whereas I've been thinking about this particular theme for another reason fairly recently. I've given a few talks on it over the years. So today, what we'll talk about is Julius Caesar related and about the man himself, but we're going to look at what in many ways I suspect people are most familiar with these days, especially those with interest in military history, and this is Caesar the General. Caesar as the military commander and look at his generalship, his style of leadership, and try and understand a little bit more of how he did things, how different or similar that was to other Roman commanders at the time. So let's plunge right in and begin with our principal source for this, as it is for so much of his military career and his career in the provinces and the Civil War, Julius Caesar's own account. In this case, from the Battle of the Sabis, variously attributed, um, associated with the River Sombra, but perhaps not. There's another theory that it's a different river. We don't need to worry about that. It's one of the most frequently quoted passages for describing Caesar's generalship. I think it's even in John Keegan's Face of Battle, which is obviously a highly influential work, not least on, on my own research. So let's begin with this. We're in book two of the Gallic Wars. Caesar had to do everything at once. Hoist the flag, which was the signal for running to arms, recall the men from their work on the camp, fetch back those who'd gone to far afield in search of material for the rampart, form the battle line, address the men, and sound the trumpet signal for going into action. And then a little bit later, in the same uh, narrative of this same action, after addressing the 10th Legion, Caesar had gone to the right wing, where he found the troops in difficulties. The cohorts of the 12th Legion were packed together so closely that the men were in one another's way and could not fight properly. As the situation was critical and no reserves were available, Caesar snatched a shield from a soldier in the rear, he had not his own shield with him, made his way into the front line, addressed each centurion by name, and shouted encouragement to the rest of the troops, ordering them to push forward and open out their ranks, so that they could use their swords more easily. His coming gave fresh heart and hope. Each man wanted to do his best under the eyes of the commander-in-chief. However, des however desperate the peril and the enemy's assault was slowed down a little. It's obvious who the hero of this narrative is. It's Caesar himself. He may have used the third person, but um, it's you know it's fairly clear. You're you're supposed to read this. There's Caesar uses these very long sentences with lots of clauses tacked on in the Latin. There's a sort of almost breathless quality. You're rushing into the action in a description like this, and at the end of it, you're supposed to take a deep breath and say, "Wow, what a guy!" And that's clearly the intention. Um, there'd be many commanders in history who would be really happy about being judged primarily through their own version of their campaigns and events rather than the opinions of others. And that's largely what we have with Caesar. There's a little bit of other evidence, but it's overwhelmingly uh, from Caesar. Now, it's interesting because there's obviously a mixture of normal behavior, but also extraordinary in this. On the one hand, he's giving orders, he's trying to prepare his army for battle, but unlike most of the engagement he claims to have occurred in the, the Gallic campaigns in the Civil War, this battle has caught him by surprise. His army isn't prepared, it's been camping, you've got the detachments going out to fetch wood, um, they're working on the ramparts, they're not formed up in a battle line, they're dispersed in fatigue parties, gradually getting a camp together for the army to stop for the night. And they've been attacked by a large force from the Belgic tribes who streamed out of cover across the river and attacking them very, very quickly. So there are also exceptional conditions to this battle. And we'll come back in detail to look at it a little bit more when we look at how just Julius Caesar did control his troops in battle. One exceptional thing, though, this is the only time where Caesar talks about 
rushing into the front lines, going forward. Notice that nice little detail he throws in, takes, takes a shield from one of the men in the rear ranks because he hasn't brought his own. Again, emphasize not prepared, but I can adapt with the situation. I will cope, I will go, and I will prick, put myself in harm's way, and I will go to where the, the crisis is. So all of that's interesting, but in many ways, what's more interesting is how this passage has been used in over the years by scholars. People will often cite this as proof that Caesar was always ready to risk his own life, to share the dangers if there was a, a critical moment. You know, he would rush, he would stand with his men, he would not abandon them. And there's a fair degree of truth in that, in the sense this was obviously the, um, the idea he wanted his men to hold, but this is the only time where he actually does something like this. So that's one thing to mention. There's in later in the Civil War, there's talk in one of the secondary sources of him doing something similar in the, the Munda campaign, uh, perhaps even more risky there. But Caesar never wrote his own version of that because he's murdered just a few months later. And by that time, he seems to have lost interest in the commentaries and their political value for him. So he does expose himself in the front line. However, it's, it's interesting because people then imagine this talks about Caesar fighting hand to hand. You know, he's there, he's grabbed this shield, presumably he's got his own sword. And I remember one of my chiefs at Oxford saying, oh, I'm sure there were the equivalent of lots of fairly burly Irish guardsmen standing around him to make sure nothing dangerous could happen or too dangerous. But nevertheless, he is there sharing the risks and he's fighting. But that is a guess. Caesar doesn't say that. There are no descriptions of an Alexander the Great style heroic charge where he leads the men in and he chops people up with his sword or uses a spear or whatever and fights personally hand to hand. None of that is mentioned. If you look closely at this passage, the Romans are not actually in contact with the Belgians at this point. They are in close proximity, the enemy are threatening, but there is enough room for the Roman legionaries to change formation, to reorder them. What Caesar is doing is actually the basic functions of a Roman commander in particular in that A, he is encouraging and inspiring the men. And notice centurions are singled out, he calls them by name, and the other ranks more generally. You know, they might be Nostri, our lads, but they're not, it's not, oh, I recognize you, Marcus, from this campaign and this sort of thing. It's, it's very much an emphasis on the command structure and probably the class structure. Of the Roman army. So your centurions are individuals, everybody else is to be inspired as a group. At least that's the way you're telling it. You're also controlling the battlefield. You're acting as battlefield manager. You are ordering the men to change their formation because what they've got is unsuitable. So you're doing an element of tactical control, yes, do this, and inspiration. But he doesn't say he's actually fighting. But of course, plenty of people imagine this, and you'll you will see it cited in this way time and time again over the years. And it always reminds me a little bit of um, George MacDonald Fraser's Flashman novels, where it's the, the anti-hero of those stories is able to pitch a yarn, even though he's this, this abject coward and runs away from everything, he can tell a story and let his audience imagine the most heroic thing that they can think of and then assume that he did that and then he takes the credit and the rewards and the fame and the glory and the medals and all that sort of thing. Caesar's almost doing the same thing. He is letting you imagine what you think a good commander and the best commander should do. He's clearly pitched himself, I am a great commander. I am the best general around. I'm doing this thing. There's a crisis. I get there. The crisis is solved. We win the battle. Everybody helps. Everybody pulls together, but it needs my presence to make this occur, to turn things around from near disaster to victory. And then lets you imagine, well, how do you think you should do that? And plenty of people do imagine him chopping up ghouls um, with his own sword, but he doesn't say that. There is no suggestion at all, or at least there's no direct claim that he fights. Um, you know, he does this, he inspires, he changes the formation, and then the battle continues but it's not about Caesar. Later on at Elysia, you also have him leading a cavalry charge and be recognized by his distinctive general's red, reddish purple cloak. And that inspires people to fight the harder, but he doesn't talk about himself charging forward and chopping down through the Vercingetorix's men and their, uh, the relieving forces. So he allows you to imagine 
those details. Now that's in contrast with Pompey, the man who would be his son-in-law for a while, political ally, but eventually enemy, and the man who'd be defeated in the early stages of the Civil War. Pompey had um, far more emphasis. He liked to style himself as the Roman Alexander. You know, He wore a cloak that supposed to belong to Alexander the Great in one of his triumphs. Um, there were descriptions that survive in Plutarch's text, for instance, of him leading charges, sword and spear in hand, and fighting and killing notable enemies. Now, Pompey didn't write his own narrative of his, his campaigns, but had people do it, do it for, for him. The historian Theophanes is one who's mentioned. None of his work survives, but he's mentioned by Plutarch. He was there with Pompey on his staff. You know, he's the new Alexander, and even in the Eastern campaigns, when he's a mature man by this time, you know, these are campaigns happening in the 60s, um, he's still supposed to be leading charges and fighting hand to hand. Not all the time. It's not just a pure Alexander, you know, set the army up and then steam at the enemy, but there is a strong element of that. There's an emphasis on very old fashioned, traditional, almost Homeric, heroic qualities in the way he's doing things. So uh, Caesar's way of telling the story is obviously a little bit different from the sort of stories that surrounded Pompey, his main rival at the time, for being the greatest Roman general of the day, and they'd like to say the greatest Roman general ever, at least up until that point, which was what mattered for a Roman politician. So these are carefully structured, carefully composed works, but we'll come back to how reliable or not they may be um, a little later on. So our theme today is Caesar as a general, Caesar as a military commander, and you know, this is nothing new. Plenty of people have talked about this over the years. I've talked about it, I've written about it in the past. Um, I've given papers on this that I've developed. Caesar went down in history as one of the great captains of antiquity and the great captains of all time. You know, Napoleon would often refer to Caesar. In fact, if you look at his order for the day for Austerlitz, there's an element where he talks about this, you know, if things are, if there's a crisis, I will come and join you in the front ranks. There's an element, it's almost like Caesar at the Sombra. You, you sort of feel that's an influence, whether direct or unconscious, in how he's presenting it. But also, that's obviously a good way to inspire an army in those conditions. Um, German scholars in the 19th and 20th century would spend a lot of time analysing Caesar's commentaries with that very methodical, attempting to be scientific, often rather critical approach to numbers. Napoleon in later life, you know, he spent some of his time on San Helena writing a commentary, or com dictating a commentary on Caesar's commentary. So comments on the Gallic War and in um, true <laughs> Napoleonic fashion, he suspected that Caesar was telling quite a few Plenty of exaggerations and a fair few downright lies to make his own role seem more glorious, just as, you know, Napoleon would have done himself, was it Montier, common bulletin, lie like a bulletin, uh, the expression of the time, um, and was sceptical. And, you know, you're left with the impression that you often get with commanders in later life writing about the campaigns of other generals, and this, you know, could just as easily be Montgomery or someone like that, that... Yes, they approve, but there is the feeling that, well, I could have done it better. You know, if, if, if I'd been there, it, we, we would have won in half the time and at half the cost and all, all this sort of thing. So it's interesting, but like most of the projects Napoleon um, engaged in in San Helena, he lost interest, he never finished it. A version has been published with a, it was an English translation fairly recently um, that's interesting of how far he got, but he, he quit because, you know, he is a man without purpose. He's stuck on this, this rock in the middle of the... Um, South Atlantic and you know what is he to do it's, it's around about that time he starts shooting at chickens and all these sort of weird stories of almost adolescent tantrums but it's it's a you know it's it's a strange time but it is significant that he did choose Caesar to talk about um, and to think about and to exercise his keep himself active his mentally active whilst he's he's in um, exile more recently you've had um, plenty of other scholars I mean in the um, just after the Second World War, you had Major General Fuller, one of the architects of the formation of the tank corps in um, the First World War, and then a, a prominent military theorist. 
in between the wars, basically the, the Germans listened to him more than the British. I mean, he, he liked and got the nickname Boney, short for Bonaparte, Fuller, rather like that. Got a little bit too chummy with the National Socialists at one point before the war, not during. Um, just because they liked tanks and he liked tanks and it you know, just seemed to be a friendship made in heaven. Um, which is obviously is a, a little bit um, oversimplistic, but um, he wrote two books, one on Alexander, one on Caesar, and the Alexander one is fulsome in its praise. You know, Alexander is a, basically a, a forerunner of the mobile warfare that Fuller would lay, lie there in bed dreaming about. Um, you know, always active, always very aggressive, very mobile, striking the enemy at the weak spot, all this sort of thing. Caesar and the Romans, by contrast, don't do anywhere near so well. You know, this is an army that entrenches every night. Trenches, don't like trenches, stalemate of First World War, don't like that sort of thing. Doesn't have enough cavalry, very plodding, very methodical, and rather careless in the way he does things. So criticism has often appeared, particularly in the last hundred years or so. Um, and, you know, some interesting comments are made by Lawrence Kepi in his book, The Making of the Roman Army, which, although, you know, this is now 40 years old, still stands up as, I think, one of the the best, I won't say introduction, although it, it, it's very readable, but it's a survey of the development of the Roman army from the sort of army of Polybius into the army of the empire. And, you know, yes, details have been added to, not least by the author himself since then with more inscriptions and evidence turning up, but it, it stands out very well as a, as a good book to read. Now his comment on Caesar's generalship is this. The reasons for Caesar's success are not hard to find. Decisiveness and instinct, rapport with the individual soldier and not a little dash of luck. His speed of movement, the legendary Caesar, Caesariana, Celeritas, astounded Roman and Gaul alike. Yet we must beware of excessive adulation of his achievements. A careful reading of the Gallic War, and especially the Civil War, reveals Caesar as often rash and impulsive, with little interest in logistics. His swiftness of action could leave the troops ill-supplied with basic foodstuffs. Often, if his brilliance is shown by extracting the army from a difficult situation, it was his rashness which had created that situation in the first place. So there's praise, and you know, you can't deny the fact that Caesar does win a lot of battles. Um, you know, and he gets murdered in a political environment in the Senate. He doesn't get defeated and killed in battle, and he never loses a campaign. There are some battles that go badly, but not many of them. And um, but he always comes out. He always finds a way to win. So. I'm not really interested today in how do we place Caesar in the pantheon of great commanders in history. You know, that's a fine as an after dinner conversation, but in the end, you cannot really rank Caesar against Alexander in terms of, you know, all the considerations, all the other factors, who they were, what situation they inherited, what the military machine was at their disposal, the resources at their disposal, what the enemies were like, what were the conditions of the time, chance, all of these things, any more than you could compare them to Napoleon, to Robert E. Lee, to Grant, to, um, you know, Rommel or Patton in the Second World War. Um, it doesn't work. You can study individual commands. You can say, well, they seem to be very good at this. This seems to be a weak spot. This is somewhere where they, you know, falls in between or they have their off days, their operations that they just don't seem to, to show the same dash that appears on other occasions. But it's like fantasy cricket teams, football teams, baseball teams, whatever, you know, it's, as I say, it's mentally diverting. It's quite interesting, but it doesn't get you anywhere because you can't prove any of it at all. And unlike Sportsmen, you don't have the statistics for commanders in the same sort of rigid and neatly formulaic way. So what I really want to try and do is understand how um, Caesar commanded an army, look at some of the characteristics of his style of command, what he did, but also place him in the context of the Roman military system, Roman commanders, other senators when put in charge of an army. Was Caesar someone who did everything very differently? To other Romans, or was he basically a fairly ordinary Roman commander in terms of his methods? It was just that he was a lot better at everything, or a lot luckier. And remember, Kepi's um, signals uh, emphasizes luck, which, of course, you know, as he himself points out elsewhere, this is something that Roman commanders like to boast about. You know, it was Sulla Felix, Sulla the Lucky. And Caesar boasted about his good fortune, you know, his connection with Venus Aphrodite as a distant ancestor, and that he was favoured 
by particular divinity and it, it's uh, it comes into that sense of many of these people you know obviously generals like this don't tend to be short of, of when it comes to ego um, but that sense of destiny that they have some part to play or they should have some part to play you know you see it with something like Patton in particular how desperate he is in the 30s and even as he gets older and even at the start of the second world war that he might be too old you know he feels that he's got this in him I I ought to be this great commander, I ought to win these great victories, but if there's no war on, if I'm not given a command in the war, how am I going to achieve this? And you can see it with Napoleon, with plenty of others, that sense of their own importance, they're, they're not short of self-esteem. Um, they believe they are the best around, that they could do it better than everyone else. In uh, Another thing you notice with successful commanders, they are rarely very generous in their judgment of other leaders, particularly their peers. You know, they nearly always believe they're the best game in town. Um, and that everybody else, yeah, they might be good at this, but they have their, their weaknesses, their flaws, all this sort of thing. So let's try and look at Caesar as the Roman general. Now, obviously, the commentaries remain our main source for this. You cannot get away from that. There are little bits of extra evidence for the Gallic campaigns. Obviously, you have fragments in Plutarch, Appian, Dio, um, and those follow through for the Civil War. Cicero's letters will, and his speeches to a slightly lesser extent, they'll mention rumours about what's going on in Gaul that often prove to be false. Um, however, it's quite interesting. Cicero does talk about receiving a letter from his brother Quintus, who was then serving as one of Caesar's uh, legati, one of his legates in Gaul, in late in 54 BC. And this letter has been sent while the army was in Britain on the second expedition, and it's got to Cicero you know, barely a month or so later. Um, what's annoying is that then he sort of says to Atticus, I've had this letter from Quintus, but moving on, he doesn't tell us a lot. It would be you know, marvellous to have something, some detail, a letter from a, the man on the spot who was actually involved in a senior capacity in one of these campaigns. But what that does make clear is that all of Caesar's commanders are writing back very frequently to Rome, and that probably extends down to tribunes and others at, at lower levels as well. So Caesar wasn't operating in a vacuum. These are obviously memoirs meant to push his own political status, his own political position. You know, he wants people to be impressed by these um, because he wants them to vote for him in the future and support him and think, yeah, wow, Caesar has done all this great stuff. You know, and unlike Pompey, who has to hire somebody to write his propaganda, if you want to call it that, his, his, his version of things, his... Um, reports on what's happening, then um, Caesar can do it himself in his own words, which gives it much more immediacy. It's much more direct. You know, this is the man himself. And we know, of course, he is writing dispatches to the Senate or letters to the Senate. It's always difficult to know precisely how these work at this time, whether you write one formally to the consuls or whichever magistrate is, is most senior and there at the time, or whether you write it to a distinguished senator who brings it to the Senate and has it read out or reads it out himself. But he's not operating entirely in a vacuum. There's obviously a delay between a situation arising in Gaul and Caesar has to make a decision. He can't say, this has come up, write to Rome, what do you want me to do about this? Like all Roman governors, he's given considerable authority to act on his own initiative, but um, it will be judged in the long run. And we'll come back to that a little bit later, but... Um, it does mean that he didn't have this blank canvas, this absolute freedom to invent, to exaggerate. He obviously tells things in a way that favours himself, but he could not wholly distort the record because he would be found out. You know, there are enough people writing back. Many of them, like Quintus Cicero, are not long-term Caesar adherents or Caesar's allies. Labienus, his most um, successful, the senior legatus in Gaul, will fight for Pompey in the Civil War. So, um, you know, there are people who don't necessarily like Caesar and you, you wonder, Labienus gets the best write-up of any of the subordinates in the Gallic Wars, but you do wonder if there was an element of this, this personal ego in the sense that he felt he didn't get the credit that he deserved for, you know, playing his, his part, a full part. He probably thought he was a better general than Caesar. Um, Caesar thinks the opposite, you know, that's how these things tend to work. Again, remember in the commentaries, that they're not written for posterity. And a few scholars try and claim this, but it, it doesn't really work. The old view used to be that they were published as a group um, 
51, 50 BC, in the 18 months or so building up towards the Civil War, after Caesar's campaigns had been completed. Um, Wiseman has, and others have argued, and I think convincingly, that in fact they probably come out year by year. In most cases, there are a few delays when it's too busy in Gaul. But they are released at the end of each campaigning season, something Caesar compiles over the winter months when campaigning stops, and they get back to Rome quickly. Bear in mind, Caesar didn't know when he arrives in Gaul that he's going to have a 10-year command, because initially it's five years and it's extended later on. Another key factor is that you can see the same man is treated rather differently. So Sabinus is treated quite well early on, um, but by the time you get to the rebellion 54-53, where he's one of the two commanders with Cotta, who um, lead a legion and a half to disaster, he is not depicted at all well there. So... <laughs> you feel Caesar would be more consistent. He would be suggesting earlier on that there were, were flaws in this man's record that could explain away the disaster that's one of the most embarrassing things he's got to talk about. So a lot um, does rather suggest that this is very immediate. These are coming out within a year, less than a year, of the events they describe, and that they develop accordingly. And the style does develop, and the, it's not just the treatment of individuals. And nor are there too many things that are suggesting this is what's going to happen next. So he wants to be seen as a great general in these, these books and a great governor, a great representative, envoy of the Roman Republic. But it's particularly, it's a great Roman general. Obviously, he's writing for this contemporary audience. And another thing that's interesting is the aristocracy, the senatorial class, and even to an extent, the equestrians don't always come out too well at the mutiny, for want of a better word, at Vesontio in 58 BC, it starts at the top. The, the hangers-on, the, the, you know, the people who've um, managed to get a command with Caesar because they're hoping for personal benefit have come from Rome, they're the ones who start carping, who start saying, oh, we shouldn't be going against Ariovistus, these Germans sound really dangerous. So it begins with people who are senators, senators' sons on the fringes of the Senate with the equestrians. And again, Apart from Labienus, who is allowed to shine, though never um, to outshine Caesar himself, he can never eclipse the commander, to the extent where you'll have him on one occasion telling his men, you know, imagine that Caesar is here, um, so you'll fight all the harder. Don't just don't fight for me, I'm Caesar's sidekick. Fight for Caesar, imagine he's here and watching you, because I'll make sure he knows and he'll reward you then, as he always does. But other senators don't appear so well. That might be a genuine reflection of the lack of talent of some of them, but it's also, it suggests that Caesar is not primarily concerned with flattering everybody at the top of Roman society. The group that does come out particularly well, and again, we saw it with the way they're singled out at um, the River Sabis, are the centurions. Centurions get named far more often than anyone else. There is possibly in um, the Civil War an ordinary soldier, a man who started in the ranks, who gets gets a name. But remember the Eagle Bearer of the Tenth, the Aquilifer of Legio uh, Ten, who in the, the first attack on Britain, when the men are hesitating, they won't disembark from the galleys, jumps over the side and starts storming ashore, saying, you know, unless you want to be humiliated and lose like, this symbol of pride, you better follow me. Man doesn't get a name. Centurions get a name. There are some that appear on several occasions, most only once or twice. If they make mistakes, it's because they're over-enthusiastic. They're so desperate to prove how great they are to Caesar, who will reward them, that they, they get overbold, they don't obey orders, and they get carried away um, with their success. You have Pullo and Varinus, the, the two character names used in the, um, the HBO Rome series, only appear once, and they go on a gall-killing competition, um, having jumped down from the ramparts to the outside of a Roman camp under siege and start fighting the enemy to show who's the bravest, therefore who is more deserving of promotion. So it's, you know, sometimes perhaps excessive zeal, excessive aggression, but nevertheless it's, it's in a very favourable way, it's a very heroic way. The ordinary soldiers get a pretty good write-up. They are most of the time Nostri, our men, our lads, our boys. And it would be hard for a patriotic Roman reading this at the time not to get 
excited by this and think, yeah, these are our lads. This is our army. And that's the whole point Caesar's trying to make. You know, this is, I am doing this for you, for the good of the res publica. We are out there as servants of Rome. We are fighting to get the very best result and to increase Roman power, increase Roman security, prosperity, all of these things. And aren't, you know, our lads are the best in the world. They can do anything. They can beat nature. They can beat any enemy, no matter how wild, all this sort of thing. So Caesar seems to be pitching the commentaries much more at a wider sweep of Roman society. Now, the centurions in particular reflect the classes that will vote in the higher centuries, the Comitia Centuriata, you know, they're these sort of country Italian gentry. Again, we hear again and again of them being promoted from a lower grade in the centurion mate to a higher grade, often in a newly formed legion, sort of bringing in experienced men, giving them extra responsibility. Apart from one occasion that's not actually talking about Caesar's army, but the Pompeians, there is no mention in Caesar of anybody who joins in the ranks and becomes a centurion. Doesn't mean there weren't any, but he doesn't talk about that. He seems to be talking very much about the more significant classes with some level of prosperity, some importance, local magistrates in Italian towns, this sort of thing, and people whose vote is significant. And when Caesar sends men back on leave to help out in the voting for Pompey for Crassus for his own um, supporters, Primarily, it's likely to be these officers who are given winter leave to go back and vote because their vote really matters. Maybe there were some others who were just burly legionaries going around to add to the bulk to threaten and intimidate opposition, but the key people are the ones whose vote really matters. It's harder to know when when you look at the the class of those who provide the ordinary soldiers, just how widespread literacy is. But again, remember, this is a world without printing presses. So books are expensive to copy out even relatively short books like one volume of the commentaries probably a lot of these were actually reached the public by being read out loud in perhaps in public meetings but also you know you, you hear about this a lot in roman literature the dinner party where someone would recite someone would um read something from their new book or read something so there's probably a lot of that, and it's a sense of getting your news that way. So Caesar is getting in with his own particular version. You know, wow, aren't I great? Isn't my army great? Look what we've done for you. You know, you gave me this great, you entrusted me with this great responsibility, and I'm living up to everything you could have expected and more. This is all good for Rome. I'm good for Rome. Next time round, vote for me. You know, that's essentially the message. Now, one problem we face when we look at some a theme like this of a, a Roman uh, military commander is, of course, in the modern world, most of all in democracies in the West and those countries that have a system based upon that, that political and military command and authority is very strictly divided. And the idea in any democracy is that the politicians are on top. You know, a uh, a president in America can sack a general, uh, whether it's MacArthur in the Korean War, um, and the general can't say, no, I'm not doing it. Um, and this, you know, in the, the British-American context, it, the roots of it go to the, the 17th century, the Civil War, and then in America in particular, obviously in the Revolutionary War, you're dealing with, well, what state should we have afterwards? And, you know, we don't want a, a dictatorship, a military dictatorship, therefore armed forces have to be kept tightly under control. And you can't be both commander and political leader at the same time. You might, as some have done, go off on after a military career and seek political office and do very well with that. But you're not, you're only going to be commander in chief in the American context when you're a civilian. So that's the modern assumption. But of course, it doesn't work at all for the Roman world. Um, you could argue that perhaps in later antiquity it moves in that direction, but even then, you know, generals intervene in politics an awful lot. And you're not dealing with elected um, leaders by that time. The Roman public career, and we've talked about this in the, you know, the Conquered and the Proud lecture on the Curses of Norum and all that sort of thing. If you want more detail, go and have a look at that. Um, that's dealing with a slightly earlier period, but most of the basics hold true. A Roman senator is going to be both. He's going to be a soldier at some point in his career and then hold political office, judicial office, all this sort of thing at other times. Generally speaking, the emphasis is more on the civil side of things than the military. So someone like Cicero 
serves during the social war in a junior capacity, um, doesn't seem to have done anything military whilst he was quaestor in Sicily. Um, and um, he, after his consulship, gives up his province and only goes with great reluctance in 51 BC to govern Cilicia when he's suddenly put in charge of an army of a couple of legions plus local allied units and auxiliaries and the like, and faced with the prospect of fighting the Parthians, although to his great relief they don't turn up in any numbers, but he still leads his campaign in um, the Amanus Mountains. That's someone who very much sees himself as a creature of the Forum, a creature of Rome. That's where he shines, you know, my oratory, my skill in the courts, all of this. This will allow me to be successful. And um, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's very much, he talks about, was it panniers on an ox, you know, not the right job, sort of job for me at all when he's out in Cilicia, wish I wasn't there, wish I was back in Rome, but I have to do my duty. That's probably extreme. Most people in an ordinary career will spend more time on, with the army. They're not necessarily on campaigns. It depends where they were sent, what was happening in that province at that time. You do have others who push it to the other extreme. So, for instance, you have Petrius, the man who in 62 BC will lead the campaign to defeat Catiline's rebels, the war that Cicero to some extent has brought to a head. Well, later on, Cicero will bring him out of, you know, you would think by this time almost retirement to go with him to Cilicia as a legatus, although not for very long. At the time of the war with Catiline, so 62 BC, when he's, um, you know, a man of, of, of middle age, the historian Sallust, who was a, a rough contemporary, he claims that Petrius had already seen 30 years military service. So he's probably older than average for somebody seeking the praetorship and this sort of thing and he's um he spent a lot of his time since his teenage years volunteering for one campaign after another so to some extent a specialist almost a professional certainly a career soldier much more than a career politician though again he does want political office as well that's an extreme case Caesar is very much someone who is uh, wanting to rise to the top politically and is also very aware of both aspects. So it is a big mistake to separate Caesar the soldier from Caesar the politician. And um, I think a lot of scholars are still prone to doing this when many are not too interested in the military side of things. So they tend to sort of write that off. And that's dangerous because it will lead to sweeping judgments about the campaigns, about how he pitches himself in the commentaries that I don't think actually hold much water. However, it's worth looking at Caesar's career before Gaul because in many ways he probably had at best about the average amount of time with the army up until that point, but perhaps even less than was, was typical or usual. He wasn't thought of as a particularly distinguished military man when he arrives in Gaul in 58 BC. It had started to change a little bit with his praetorship, but this is not someone who had done the Petrius line of things and spent as much time with the army as he possibly could. So let's have a look at his career up until this point on this slide. So. 58 BC, Caesar's made proconsul with the province of Cisalpine Gaul in Illyricum for five years uh, by popular vote, and then Transalpine Gaul is added on by senatorial decree. The governor happens to die and leaves it vacant. Later, this is extended to five years, but again, he didn't know that was going to happen, nor did he necessarily feel that he would need 10 years rather than five. So military experience, maybe one to two years as a junior officer, aged about 20 to 22. Because of his um, appointment, or at least nomination, for the post of Flamen Dialis, because of his associations with Sulla's opponents, um, Caesar doesn't have a normal career. And had he ended up as Flamen Dialis, he wouldn't have had a military career at all. You know, Flamen wasn't allowed to see a dead body, or this sort of thing, wasn't allowed to go more than a short distance from Rome itself. So his career starts a little bit late when he's 20, 22. Um, he goes off to Asia Minor and he wins the Corona Civica, the civic crown, Rome's highest decoration for gallantry, traditionally for saving the life of a fellow citizen who was supposed to make the wreath and present it to you, whether that was still normal by Caesar's day, whether it would become more generally an, an award for distinguished service, we don't quite know. And we don't know the circumstances. But that's his 
taste of military service, and he does obviously very, very well, takes to it like a duck to water, wins this decoration. But again, you know, it could be a little bit like a sort of Winston Churchill in his early days. His military career is getting himself attached as correspondent so he can get on campaign, trying to get mentioned in dispatches, all of this sort of thing, and making a living through writing for the newspapers and then producing books on, on this where he you know, uh, wrote very well. Uh, something to remember about Caesar and the commentaries. Um, and Churchill is a, is a wonderful comparison in this respect, is yes, these are utterly partisan. This is Caesar telling you his version of events, but he does it extremely well. Now, people would argue that maybe Cicero at the time of Caesar's dictatorship couldn't have said anything else, but he did praise them for their style and said, you know, they're supposed to be the material for historians, but they'd put off anyone with sense because they're too good. This is very elegant Latin. It, it has tended to suffer over the years because often it's inflicted on school children because it's grammatically fairly correct, fairly easy. So it's when they're starting to learn Latin and finding it really hard, they read Caesar. When they've actually got decent Latin, they go on and they read other people um, and they like those authors more. And it's partly a reflection of they've just got better at the language. But Caesar does have a particular style, a great elegance, and it reflects his oratory that was also very, very powerful. Now, these are extremely well written. These do stand up as pieces of literature as well as uh, accounts of, of campaigns and um, descriptions of decision making and this sort of thing. Um, and it compares with Churchill. Caesar had that way with words that you see in someone like Churchill, where if you look at his you know, early books like the Malacan Field Force, the River War, they're extremely well written. These are very readable for someone who is so young and someone who'd not been a distinguished scholar at school. So, you know, you have something of that, that energy. And yes, you know, the old joker, Winston's written another book about himself. Um, there is a, some similarity with Caesar in that respect. It, it's, but nevertheless, it is, um, these are powerful. These are extremely good. These are extremely um, efficient at getting his message across. Anyway, sorry, in one of my usual digressions, let's go back to Caesar's um, career. Now, sometime around about 75 BC, he gets captured by pirates and ransomed. When he goes back, when he's been released, he goes to the governor asking him to give him troops or go off and capture these pirates and execute them. Governor doesn't do it, so Caesar, on his own authority, through force of personality as much as anything else, persuades the local communities to raise some men, get together some ships, equip them, goes out, chases down the pilots, pirates, sorry, arrests them, crucifies them, and again, you know, it's because he's a nice guy and their throats are cut first so they don't die a slow death, but they are nailed up. Maybe a year or so later, 74 BC, again, as a private citizen, um, he raises a militia in Asia and drives off raiding forces from Pontus. You know, King Mithridates is fighting this long drawn out uh, series of campaigns and wars against the Romans. 70 or 71, Caesar is elected military tribune. He's one of the 24, the traditional number for the old four legions, even though there are far more legions than that and far more military tribunes than this. So it's a prestigious thing. No source mentions where he was posted um, during his, his tribunate. The assumption tends to be that, well, that means he probably stayed in Italy. And of course, you've got just at this time, Spartacus Rebellion is at its height. So there is a reasonable chance that Caesar served perhaps under Crassus, um, but against Spartacus in some capacity then. But we don't, it's, it's a guess, it's a conjecture, it's a plausible one, but it's no more than that. And we don't know anything about what he did during that time. Then you're jumping on another decade when in 61 to 60, he governs further Spain. Um, he fights a successful campaign, he supplements his army with locally raised troops, and, you know, this is distinguished. The accounts of it are fairly meagre. Caesar didn't leave his own version of, of these. You can see, if you want to, signs of the Caesar who will appear in the Gallic Wars already at this stage, but it's, um, you know, we don't really know enough to say very much. And maybe he starts to, you know, there's the hint of, um, 
centurion Skyver, who will later appear with great distinction um, and getting shot to bits at Dihachium, but surviving and still fighting uh, in the Civil War. And later there's an Arla Skyvi, a cavalry regiment presumably raised by this bloke um, after he's, he's been promoted again. Um, he may be around. There's, the name is slightly distorted in, in um, the, the manuscript tradition, but he might be somebody that Caesar spotted as a talented young officer, even as early as Spain. Um, but we're, you know, limited numbers in this respect. You're not, uh, this is a fairly small army. Um, not everybody who serves with him in Spain will go on. He certainly doesn't take any of the units that he um, forms in Spain. They don't serve under him later than that. That's, that, that doesn't happen. It's not the way the Roman army worked. So he's got there in 58 BC with, you know, he's 41, not a great amount of military experience. And the Spanish experience has been the only army command, at least the official one, and that will be dwarfed by the, the scale of the operations in Gaul. So he's, what he's done, he's done very well. He's been successful at every point, but he is not coming into this, compared to somebody like Pompey, who is, of course, very unusual, very exceptional in his career, and who has spent most of his youth fighting wars and leading armies, Caesar hasn't done that. So, you know, everybody in 59, 58 BC, when they look at Caesar, you know, Sallus talks about him being desperate for a chance to excel, to get a war, to win distinction. Caesar clearly thought, I'm a great man, I'm going to be a great commander. And, you know, I, I've shown how great I am already. But you would not have expected many Romans to have rated him particularly highly at this point. You know, he isn't a famous commander. They don't really know what he's going to do in Gaul. He's been very successful oiling his way up the political ladder and he's been notorious, you know, he's Pontifex Maximus, he's done all these things, he's made this unofficial alliance with Pompey and Crassus that has got him to the consulship um, and allowed him then to force through legislation that he might not have managed otherwise for their benefit more than his own. Um, there's a mixture of that, obviously, again, something we can talk about uh, on another day. But on the whole, he has... Um, you know, he's not been, he isn't the great military man. He's not perceived in that respect. And you could also argue that the, the men he takes with him as subordinates are not a particularly distinguished group when it comes to military record. Um, you've got Titus Labienus, who will prove to be exceptionally gifted. We don't really know what he's been doing. You know, he may have been serving with Pompey. The, the, um, you know, there's a good case to be made that there's a pre-existing connection with Pompey that most likely has to do with service maybe against the pirates, maybe against Mithridates, perhaps even earlier, who knows. But we know so little about the man. Um, you've got Lucius Cornelius Balbus, Quintus Cicero, various other senators. You know, they've got a lot of people from um, not necessarily the very top families, unless they're associated with Pompey or Crassus. You get both of Crassus's sons, Publius and Marcus, will serve under Caesar. Um, Decimus Brutus, that's cousin of the famous Brutus, but also a man who would join the conspiracy and, um, you know, son of a, a woman who'd been heavily involved and associated with Catiline, so somebody on the sort of the radical side of politics, if you want to put it that way, um, is there. But nevertheless, they're not... Um, you know, this isn't the sort of the star team of all your famous military men going off under your most famous military commander. These are mostly people who have yet to prove themselves fully. And plenty of, you know, we do have to remember Roman governors do go off and they get defeated. They sometimes get killed. And, you know, they're probably in the early stages, the, the attacks on Caesar build up as time goes on. But there were probably a fair few people who thought, well, he's not going to do that much. You know, we don't need to worry too much about him. The bigger threats are people like Clodius, their Pompey, Crassus, who are on the spot in Rome. And it's only with hindsight that we see this as a sort of constant attacks by people like Cato and others against Caesar. Caesar becomes more important later on. And thank you to Gussie the Cat for pushing the door open so that it's magically uh, come open behind me. But uh, hopefully that's not too distracting. So, um, however, once Caesar goes to Gaul, the rest of his life is dominated by warfare to an extent that is completely different. The opposite, whereas it's only been a few years now and again, a couple of years each decade at the most, where he's seen military service up until this point. From um, 58 BC onwards, with the exception of the year 50 BC, and we don't know too much about what was going on then, 
there's no year when he doesn't fight a major campaign. Um, again, the other exception would be 44 BC, but he's murdered on the Ides of March, and he's just about, he's several days from setting off for a big campaign against the Dacians and then the Parthians. So, you know, Caesar um, spends most of his, his middle age, the remaining part of his life, at war. And sometimes I think perhaps this is one of the advantages of, of writing like a biographer, but sometimes I think scholars forget the strain and the toll this must have taken on it, on anyone. And also the amount of time where he's just simply too busy um, with managing these campaigns to do much else. So from then on, his life is, is dominated by warfare. And you have later on the... Um, the elder Pliny will talk about when he's talking about who fought the most battles, who won the most victories. And he says, Caesar also fought 50 pitched battles and was the only general to surpass Marcus Marcellus, who had fought 39. Marcellus um, gets killed by an ambush by Hannibal's men in the Second Punic War. So, you know, he was, he, he might have, had his career not been terminated at that point, he might have gone on and fought some more. But that's, that's, that's one of the ways Caesar is remembered for fighting more than anyone else. And if you look at the number of major battles, he probably does end up doing far more than Pompey had done. Pompey's career is weighted the other way. In his youth, he fights a lot. Then he has this burst of activity in the 60s. Then throughout the 50s, he doesn't go anywhere. And then at the last, when he's you know around about 60, he gets involved in the civil war with Caesar. And Plutarch emphasizes how vigorous he is for a man of his age. You know, He's training with his men. He's vaulting onto horses, he's throwing javelins, he's fighting with practice weapons, he's joining in their exercises. And that's the sort of thing a Roman commander should be doing. It's a good inspirational thing, but it's also emphasized as, you know, look at this old boy, he's still, you know, trying to prove he's up to it um, and can manage this. But he is, he is much less fresh. He is much less fit in terms of simply age as much as anything else, but also recent practice by the time the Civil War comes along. You don't really feel you perhaps see Pompey at his very best, at his peak, in the confrontation with Caesar. So let's look at um, the um, how Caesar turned the army in his province in Gaul from being a Roman army into Julius Caesar's army. So here we've got a chart of the growth of Julius Caesar's army in Gaul. We won't deal with the civil war because that gets particularly complicated with all the troops that are changing sides and that sort of thing. When Caesar arrived in Gaul in 58 BC, there were four legions already in his provinces. Remember, his provinces were three combined into one command. They're, these are the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. He raises two new ones. Now, the orders for this may already have gone out before he actually physically arrives in his province because he delays a little bit because of events in Rome before moving to northern Italy. And then you get news of the Helvetii that are pushing towards Transalpine Gaul and that provokes him to jump into action and the commentaries start at that point. So there are two newly raised legions in addition from 59, early 58. These are number 11 and number 12. So the total is six at this point. Two of them um, freshly raised, so the army he inherited has increased by 50% in size, at least in the number of formations of, of basic units. Um, over the winter of 58 to 57 BC, he raises two more new legions, 13 and 14, bringing the total up to eight. So in the course of, after one campaigning season basically and two campaigns against the Helvetii then against Ariovistus his army has doubled in size four legions up to eight now Agio 14 is destroyed in the winter of 54 to 53 so that's a total of seven perhaps less than seven because Cotter and Sabinus have 18 uh, sorry 15 cohorts with them so a legion and a half assuming the the other five cohorts are legionaries rather than auxiliary troops. Uh, three new legions are raised as a result, the 14th, the 15th, and the 1st, which comes on loan from Pompey. It had been raised um, to be sent to Spain, the provinces he's been given during his um, proconsulship um, after the consulship of 55, and um, it's given to Caesar. That brings the total up to 10. 
some point in the next years, there's another legion raised, the sixth appears, and an unofficial legion of non-citizens from Cisalpine Gaul that will become Legio Fithalaudae, the Larks. They're noted as having 22 cohorts to start off with, so that's because more than double um, as the strength of a, an ordinary legion. So you're probably dealing with uh, 11, 12-ish, depending on how you're counting Fifth Allowed at what point Caesar gives these men um, citizenship, because they do become a proper regular legion, the men become Roman citizens. When that happens, is that during the Civil War? Is that in the build-up to the Civil War? Most of this has been, um, you know, conducted on Caesar's own authority, but the Senate hasn't stopped him. The funding aspect, who's been paying for these troops, isn't always clear. Caesar was granted some leeway in the renewal of his province. He is given the right to raise troops. So it might be this is retrospectively recognising some of the things he's done. Um, again, those are all other issues for another day. And when we look at the, the army of the first century BC, there's a lot we don't really understand, even by comparison to other periods. But what you can see is a very big increase very quickly. Now, we'll talk about that in a moment, but let's just add the few mentions. Caesar doesn't talk too much about the non-citizen troops other than the formal allies provided by tribes like the Aedui and others. He does occasionally mention sort of professional auxiliaries. You've got Balearic slingers, Cretan archers, Numidian javelinmen, apparently on foot, um, and Spanish cavalry appear just once in the Gallic Wars. And then in 49 BC, Caesar has this throwaway line that is deeply frustrating to historians where you think, well, what else are you not telling us? And he mentions 3,000 cavalry, which he had had with him in all his past campaigns, also 5,000 infantry. These are non-citizen auxiliary troops, semi-professionals, you know, foreshadowing part of that development of the, the, the regular professional auxilia that we'll, be, uh, we'll see in the Army of the Empire. Uh, he doesn't say how long he's had those 5,000 infantry. Um, you get mention in the Civil War of two Gallic chieftains, Rusulus and Egus, who've been drawing pay based on false returns for the number of men they had in their unit strength. Um, which does rather suggest quite a regular organisation. Um, so I suspect a lot of the things we think of as coming later for the development of the auxilia have already been happening in Roman armies before then. It's just that it's it's all brought together and sort of best practice is standardised and made official um, later on under Augustus and then the Julia Claudians. So you also get various other allies at different times. So. The main strength of the army will be the legions. Now, this is what Caesar talks about. They're prominent, and of course, this is the era before you've um, developed the auxilia fully to the time when they will normally be at least 50% of a, a field army strength and often more. And it's after the social war that had occurred in Caesar's youth, where in the aftermath, all the allies of Italy get Roman citizenship. So you don't have the, the ally, the old fashioned allied units of Latins and others that would serve alongside each legion. So that's why there's, there's, there are more legions in this army. So this army compares, if you think you've got about 10 legions this would compare to an army of five in the old days of the 2nd century BC, five plus all the allied units that effectively double the strength. So it is a large army. It doesn't always operate in one place and concentrated, but it can do. Um, however, you have to be very careful, obviously, for the number of people who are actually in each legion, each cohort isn't clear all the time. By the Civil War, many of Caesar's legions appear to be operating at about 50% of their theoretical strength. So they're, you know, by the time of Pharsalus, the cohorts 200, uh, 250 or less, um, you know, whereas it should be about 480. Uh, by the time you get to the Alexandrian campaign, the sixth legion, or at least the effectives present with the unit when it follows Caesar to Alexandria, number barely a thousand. So legions can still operate when they're well below their theoretical strength, just as all units of all armies in history tend not to be, don't tend to have the number of people they're supposed to have. They can still function. They just adapt the way they do things. The internal organization might change a bit. But if you think about that, the, the, the increase, if we go back to the chart and the number of legions is very, very significant and initially very rapid, you know, when it can in barely a year doubles in size. 
your army. Now, just that means that you've created four new legions. That means um, 240 centurions and uh, 24 tribunes. So all of those posts have to be filled. And Caesar talks a lot about promoting men, as I mentioned before, from a lower grade of the Centurion 8 in one legion to a higher grade in a newly formed unit. Your tribunes are coming, some of them are semi-professionals, some of them are just volunteers coming from Rome. We we hear mention in the, the first campaign of somebody who's you know had a good reputation from Sulla's day and is recommended to Caesar and but you know gets the blame put on him when he, he makes a mistake that you, know, you feel, well, okay, that might be fair, but it might just be Caesar passing the buck. So what it does mean is that it gives Caesar immense amounts of patronage. So on the one hand, he can see talent and reward it. So this bloke's good. Let's give him more responsibility, give him a bigger command, because that will make my army more efficient and particularly allow these young soldiers to be trained and led in a way that will allow them to become efficient um, sooner than otherwise. And there, you know, we don't run the risk that this unit's going to collapse or break under the pressure. We're preparing them as well as we can. We're giving them all the opportunities to serve well and serve with distinction. So you can see it on a purely practical basis that this is all about finding talent, rewarding it. And Caesar is good at that, just as Napoleon and others have been good at that. You know, but people like Napoleon had this immense freedom to promote whoever they liked. Roman commanders have that in the field, but they also, and that's true of Napoleon as well, had to deal with lobby interests, um, other people saying, look, you know, I've got this son, I've got this nephew, I've got this young protege that I think is good. Can you bump him up for me? Um, but what it does mean is that within barely a year, at least half the officers in Caesar's army owe their rank, whether initial rank or their promotion to him and to his reward, his largesse. So there's also a strong element of converting your army from being just an army of the Roman people that has had previous commanders and it's served under them. Remember, those four legions he inherits have been there for quite some time. They are already experienced units and they are perceived as such and presented as such by Caesar. So the men there don't owe their job to you. But as you start to spread them around, you promote them to other units, you are, as I say, giving out lots of rewards to people. You are putting them in both a moral debt, but also, you know, in the Roman sense, quite a strong debt um, because you're expected to return favours. So it does mean that as the army increases, and it does, you know, it basically trebles in size by the end, even more commissions are coming up, even more opportunities for promotion. So by the end of the war, nearly everybody will have owed at least a step in promotion and perhaps their original commissioning and more than one step in promotion to Caesar. And to have proved yourself to have shown talent, to have shown ability, to have shown good connections, but also Caesar has to recognize that and has done so, and therefore you, you know, are well disposed towards him. And on top of that, Caesar was also very, very generous with plunder, and you know, a lot of these people become rich, and senior commanders in particular, but all the way down. People are getting the spoils, these immense profits he's making from enslaving, you know, allegedly a million people in the Gallic campaigns, and from Again, this is not what Caesar says, but um, Suetonius, Plutarch and others talk about him looting all the temples, never being bothered about taking plunder from sacred sites and this sort of thing. Although there's, there's some slightly contradictory stories about that. And Gaul was not thought of as one of the wealthiest areas of the ancient world. It's, you know, it's not the, the opulent wealth of an Asian campaign. Nevertheless, everybody does rather well. Caesar's forum that he starts buying up property for and hiring people that you can, you can partly see behind the Curia uh, Julia today in the forum site. It's not, it's not very well presented, not, not that easy to uh, understand the details. That's all paid for by the spoils from Gaul. And he's backing loads of politicians like Mark Antony and others, um, like Curio, and, you know, to give them um, Caelius Rufus, you know, Cicero's uh, correspondent, get, basically get bought out by Caesar. So a lot of people are being rewarded, but that's also happening in the army. So the vast majority of centurions and to a fair extent the tribunes, as time goes on, owe something to Caesar. Initial commission, promotion, perhaps several promotions, as well as lots of plunder and lots of praise. And again, remember, in the commentaries, they get a really good write up. These are presented as some of the greatest heroes of the story. 
Now, there are men who've been recommended to Caesar by Pompey, and when the civil war comes along, you know, he's supposed to let them go quite happily. Suetonius says he's allowed, you know, they go, they take the property with them. Even Labienus, and he does seem hurt by Labienus' defection, he sends his baggage after him. Um, you know, they're allowed to go, but even these are, you know, people with mixed emotions by that point. Now, all of this is fairly obvious that this expansion has happened, but sometimes people forget the implications this has for the nature of the army, the nature of loyalty, the how Caesar is able to fight the civil war and why his army is so, as he would present it, fanatically loyal. But again, we don't hear of big defections from Caesar's men to the other side during the civil war. Partly there aren't the opportunities, but it does say something about what's going on. Now, gaining the trust of the army was another gradual process. There is, unfortunately, a tendency, and when people see, you know, they see hints in Spain of Caesar's genius, they look at his early escapades where he raises private armies to fight Mithridates' men or the pirates or whatever. Um, there's a sense that Caesar has sort of basically been born a genius, a great commander, um, this charismatic individual who wins over soldiers, other people's wives, all this sort of thing. Yes, Caesar has lots of these personal talents, but it isn't an instant thing that he arrives in Gaul and an army that are mainly composed of strangers um, suddenly become his devoted, almost fanatical followers. The first campaign is fairly shaky. You know, he attempts a night attack on the Helvetii by Labienus and two legions. That's a third of the army as it stands at that point. And they're supposed to seize high ground beyond the enemy camp, then be joined by Caesar for a night attack. You know, even these days, night attacks are hard to do, moving around in the darkness. A chap called Considius, this is the fellow who's been recommended to him by um, others and is, has a reputation going back to Sulla's day mistakes Labienus's men for Gauls already in position waiting to ambush the Romans, you know, says he's definitely seen their crests and all this sort of thing. Um, and Caesar halts, so Labienus and his two legions are left out on a limb. Fortunately for the Romans, the Helvetii are blissfully unaware of all of this. They've just been simply having a night in camp, getting on with doing all the things that they need to do, um, and the next morning just move off without noticing that the Romans are there. Now, that could have been a disaster, but Caesar's luck carries him through, and it's a sign of inexperience. Um, however, the way he goes about it, the, the routine, is... I remember finding it strikingly similar to the routine we were taught for patrolling um, in the OTC at Oxford, and watching a, a British Army video with, I think, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers doing it, and slightly hammerly, about going through, sending in a recce patrol, preparing the way before a fighting patrol follows the same route, and all this sort of thing. How you go about these things, all the precautions you take, that the actual, the attempt is presented by Caesar as sound, and it only goes wrong because Considius panics and gets confused. Um, there's probably lots of other reasons why it went wrong, and these things are always a bit risky, but again, this is warfare, this is friction, um, you know, things happen. In the battle that develops later on, where Caesar confronts the Helvetii and defeats them, he makes a striking gesture, and he tells us this at the start of the battle, that after he's drawn up his army, he has his own horse sent away as a message to show the men that, well, you know, if things go pear-shaped, I'm not going to just gallop off and leave you in the lurch. I'm standing with you. He never again does this. It never happens, it's never mentioned at any point. And, um, you know, normally Caesar in command is highly mobile and therefore on horseback. And, you know, other sources tell us how that he was a great rider and how he'd schooled himself to, you know, ride well and all this sort of thing over the years um, and that you know he's physically emphasizing you know trains to be fit to have it increase his stamina even though he's not by nature a robust man you know part a lot of his command is trying to do all the things he's asking his soldiers to do um, now there aren't many parallels for this sending away of a horse um, in one of the battles against the Cimbri and Teutones the first major fight Marius is supposed to have taken his place in the front rank and fought sword in hand. Again, remember, this comes after successive Roman defeats by these same migrating tribes. So this is a, a, it's a symbolic gesture. Once you're there, you can't do much in the way of commanding. You can't do much in the way of controlling what's going on. But it is setting an example and saying, we're not going anywhere. I'm going to live or die with you. You know, we either win or we all die, but I'm not going to leave you. Um, in his last fight, Spartacus is supposed to have cut the throat of a horse that had you know, been captured from a Roman commander, um, again, to show his men, I'm with you, I'm not going anywhere, I am going to share your fate, good or bad. 
But it's interesting. It's a sign that Caesar does this at the start. He's got to prove to his men that they can trust him, they can rely upon him, because that trust is not there. It doesn't just spring up. Now, um, later you have in the same year in 58, he leads towards the campaign against Ariovistus, and this is the mutiny at Vesontio, which I mentioned already. And you can see, this is again Caesar's account. A panic arose from inquiries made by our troops and remarks uttered by the Gauls and traders, who affirmed that the Germans were men of a mighty frame and an incredible valour and skill at arms. For they themselves, so they said, at meetings with the Germans, had often been unable even to endure their look and the keenness of their eyes. So great was the panic, and so suddenly did it seize upon all the army that it affected in serious fashion the intelligence and courage of all ranks. It began first with the tribunes, the contingent commanders, the prefects, and the others who'd followed Caesar from Rome to court his friendship without any, greater experience, any great experience in warfare. Some sought permission to leave. Some were compelled by very shame to stay. They were unable to disguise their looks, or even at times restrain their, fear, their tears. They hid in their tents to complain of their own fate or to lament in company with their friends the common danger. Everywhere throughout the camp there was signing of wills. Even men who had long experience in the field, soldiers and centurions and cavalry commander, were gradually affected. Now this is a situation where again you start to see what we think of as a characteristic Caesar. His army has got depressed and then there are arguments about, well, you know, we've held Eti fine, they were threatening our allies, that's okay. Ariovistus seems a long way away. In your own consulship he's been made King, named king and friend of the Roman people. You know, he's an ally. We don't want to get involved in this. But Caesar presents it as well. We're really just scared of these Germans. And Caesar presents every sort of escalation of the war, every time he moves further away from his province as justified by the interests of the Republic and the, the Roman people. You know, our allies are under threat. If we don't protect our allies, we won't have any allies anymore. Therefore, I need to act. I need to see this. And he also, he will raise the specter in this book of the Cimbri and the Teutones and other earlier Roman disasters in the sense that you just can't trust these northern barbarians uh, because they're always a threat. They're always on the move. They're dangerous. They're aggressive. And, you know, they've beaten us before. So it takes a good Roman army led by a really great commander like me to make sure that we, we stop them. We block them first before they can be a serious threat, before the problem gets out of hand. Again, some, probably some contemporaries were sceptical of how he presents this, but uh, we have to try and see this in Roman eyes from the first century BC. Most of what he says and presents is plausible, reasonable, rational from the perspective of a Rome that considers its power to be something that needs to be defended and, if possible, increased. So Caesar faces a serious problem with his own army, and they see the door going again as Gussie strides into the room um, and hopefully will not jump up and do any more disturbances, but uh, if he does, he does. I suppose I should really have a cat called Julius or Caesar for this talk, but uh, that wasn't possible to arrange in the time. Um, at Vesontio, Caesar presents this that most of his army is refusing to move, that they are simply, they're using the excuse of, oh, we shouldn't be going, you know, this is not part of your remit from the Senate. You're pushing outside the area you're supposed to look after, and, you know, Ariovistus isn't our enemy, he's an ally of the Roman people. And Caesar takes great care to present what he does then and in all subsequent escalations and extension of the campaigns as entirely in the interest of the Roman people. And whether or not we would agree with that, again, for for a first century BC Roman, it would be hard not to be excited, not to feel, oh, well, you know, these just load of foreigners who had it coming. It looks as if the army is going to refuse to march out. Caesar then proclaims that doesn't matter what the rest of you do, but tomorrow morning I am marching out at the head of the 10th Legion and, you know, we'll face Ariovistus on our own if that's what's necessary. The 10th Legion is wonderfully flattered by this. Yeah, of course, we're the best, you know, we're the, the hardest lads out there. We can do this. And they, they immediately say to Caesar, yes, of course, we'll do that. We're the special boys, you know, we're with you. At which point the other Legion's unit pride starts to be stoked up. And they say, well, you know, what's so special about the 10th? And um, we'll all go. So Caesar persuades them in this way and the whole thing falls apart. Everybody marches out in the subsequent campaign. They will defeat Ariovistus. This is the first real sign of him favouring the 10th Legion. That again, you know, you need to emphasise, wasn't raised by him. So quite why he picked on them, why he just saw something in their leaders, their commanders, the, the way the men acted and marched that was special, or whether he makes them special by flattering them so much. You know, perhaps they were 
unruly and he decides well if i you know use these as my my elite they'll actually start to come into line uh because i'll reward them and praise them and they'll 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 end up believing it themselves we just don't know enough we we don't know about the origins of these units. We don't know who had raised them. We don't know what they've been doing other than they've been in the provinces um, before he arrives. So this is the the start of that special relationship, at least of the way Caesar tells it. Um, and it goes on from there. So you have the way he exploits unit pride. You've got two victories against Helvetia and then against Ariovistus. Two major battles are won, overwhelmingly won with lots of plunder, lots of slaves, and as far as we can tell, you know, reasonably limited Roman casualties. These are not terribly costly victories. Again, that pattern that I've talked about elsewhere, ancient battles, the winner tends to lose far fewer men than the defeated army. It's, it's disproportionately men who die in battle die in when an army breaks in the initial pursuit. And in the case of Ariovistus and to some extent the Helvetii, Caesar's pursuit, as it will characteristically be, is particularly vigorous and you know, lasts and reaches a long distance. Therefore, there are a lot of people slaughtered at that point when they're not really in a position to fight very well. Then we have, we come back to our quote at the start, the Battle of the Sabis, you know, perhaps the Sambra, perhaps not, in 57 BC, where Caesar goes into the front ranks. Now, as I've said before, he doesn't talk about fighting we have to imagine that but he does take charge he shares the danger you know this is an area because he talks elsewhere men have been moving out of range of the enemy missiles so he's certainly within the range of being hit by something whether he actually fights hand to hand or not who knows he doesn't feel the need to tell us that he lets us imagine whatever we want to imagine but it does mean that it's another like sending your horse away this is going even further this is the crisis of the battle i go there i take my place with everybody else so you can see how the trust that develops between Caesar and his soldiers is a gradual thing. It isn't an instant Caesar turns up, he's charismatic, everybody thinks he's great, everybody knows somehow that he is this great commander and that they're going to keep winning with him and therefore they trust him. It's a combination of shared hardships on campaign and Caesar's personal behavior and example, you know, he is working hard, he is sharing the rigors of the march, he is sharing the dangers when necessary of battle, he's also winning, and under him they are winning. And everybody really deep down will want to go into battle thinking, I'm going to come out of this alive and better off. You know, you want to win. You don't want to go to a battle expecting to lose and to suffer. So that confidence builds up and along with it trust in Caesar himself. And it only grows stronger as the campaigns continue. By 48 BC, Caesar could actually leave part of his army in Macedonia and try to sail to Italy. In fact, he can't, though the weather's against him. Um, and the only thing that he tells us the soldiers are angered about was that he was not confident enough to rely on them solely, that he felt the need for reinforcements from Italy, and he was going to try and hurry those up. Now, that's the difference where you're getting this, this later, this civil war army that is absolutely convinced that with Caesar in charge they can always win it doesn't matter what the odds are it doesn't matter who the enemy are the position we will just win and later on um, before the African campaign when there is a mutiny mostly surrounding the 10th legion who are asking to be demobilized and rewarded saying why are we taking all the risk you know you sort of have a slight sense of some of the divisions that came back for the Normandy campaign from the Mediterranean like the 7th Armoured, 51st Highland that sort of thing the sense that why can't some of the other so-and-so's who've been sitting on their backsides take a turn now this of course is the famous occasion where he relies on his willpower and his reputation and just his his charisma this is the time when caesar rides into the mutinous camp gets up on the rostra of the commander's podium and begins his speech not by calling them comilitones comrades the term he's always used but quirites citizens civilians and says yeah go if you like i don't need you i'll win the war without you at which point 10th Legion goes into hysterics and, you know, begs Caesar to decimate them. They hand over the ringleaders and say, you know, and go off and fight extremely well in Africa and in the remaining campaigns. And many of them will go on and fight in the civil wars that follow Caesar's death. They're still, um, you know, pretty keen and pretty eager then. So there is a tremendous charisma with Caesar. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's a perhaps a stage bandage moment, perhaps there were more preparation, but nevertheless, to have the the sort of, you know, the, 
the sheer self-confidence and to do that and get away with it. Um, but he's exploiting that pride. He's exploiting that connection. The relationship between Caesar and his soldiers and their units has built up. And of course, it's been fostered by all the promotions, by the rewards of plunder, of extra pay, of lavish weapons. You know, Suetonius tells us he liked the men to be dressed up and look as impressive as they could. But again, none of this was instant. It's taken a long time to reach that level of fanatical loyalty, which you do see in the Civil War. Right, let's move on to some themes. Let's look at strategy, because obviously this is something where people like, you know, I gave the Kepi quote, but others have criticised Caesar for being rash by modern, uh, by a lot of modern standards. Um, we have to remember some of this is, you know, there's a lot that's opportunistic about Caesar's campaigns, which is probably true of a lot, a lot more wars than we might like to think, but nevertheless, Everybody, it's like governments, they like to present the idea that anything good that happened was something that they planned, anything bad that happened was just, you know, something beyond their control, couldn't possibly have been foreseen. Commanders are much the same. When Caesar arrived in Gaul in 58 BC, there's a pretty good chance he wasn't thinking of writing the Gallic commentaries and fighting wars there, let alone of going to Britain or crossing the Rhine or anything like that. The army was actually concentrated with three out of the four legions in Illyria, and they are thinking of a Balkan war. And he you know, might be still thinking of this perhaps as late as 57, 56, when there's that lull in the operations in Gaul. He's won a few victories. Um, this is the time of Borobista, the Dacian king who'd united the kingdom, was very powerful. Don't know too much about, but Caesar seems to have been thinking of him as a potential, you know, strong enemy to take on and either humble by making him submit or defeat um, in that very Roman way. He's probably thinking of him again in 44 BC. After all, he's going to the Danube first before the Parthian expedition begins. Instead, the Helvetii arrive, and whereas there'd been rumours of them migrating a couple of years earlier, and Cicero talks about this then, nothing had come of it, so people had sort of thought, that, well, that threat's gone away. So Caesar, looking at it as a governor, is, A, there's not a threat there, but also, where's my opportunity? I need money, I need glory, I need fame, I need a war. In fact, the Helvetii offer him those things on a plate. He responds by blocking their route through... Um, Transalpine Gaul. Then when they move on, the Aedui and others complain. Caesar chases them, out going out of his province, which is, you know, you, you could be interpreted as against um, Sulla's law restricting provincial commands, a law that Caesar himself will basically rephrase slightly, but largely confirm in due course. Um, nevertheless, it's presented, as I mentioned before, everything he does is presented as this is the right thing. This is in the interest of the Roman people. I must do this because otherwise our prestige will suffer. If our prestige suffers, if our reputation for good faith and strong protection of our allies goes, then we won't have any allies. Our power will diminish. And each campaign follows on from that. He probably pushes to the very limits what a Roman governor should do. But again, always presents it in a logical way as in Rome's interest and you know they probably just about were certainly there would be a way of interpreting all he does by that there's not really that much criticism of what he's doing Cato tries to prosecute him and charge him with breach of faith by attacking a group of Germans during a new period of negotiation so therefore you know this is Rome's fides is being challenged and that that was a sort of an unlawful attack and a massacre and it's bad for our reputation they're not saying, well, you shouldn't go to Britain, you shouldn't go you should fight the Helvetii, you shouldn't go and fight Ariovistus. That doesn't seem to be a big source of criticism. Um, and, you know, it's, but you also have, and, and some governors are, you know, Gabinius, the man who's gone and put Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy Aletes, back on the, the throne in Egypt, is prosecuted on his return for doing that and for you know, supposedly being bribed to do it. The main difference to other governors is his the length of, of term of office. You know, even Lucullus and Pompey didn't have so many years of consecutive command in the same war. Pompey had come close in the civil war in the 70s BC, where basically having fought for Sulla, it then goes on to fighting um, all around the Mediterranean, culminating the war against Sertorius. But that's very much a civil war context, and only the latter part of that's official. Um, this does mean that Caesar can have confidence that I'm not going to be replaced at the end of the year, as you know, most Roman governors had to worry about that, can therefore plan a little bit ahead. And there's, there's glimpses of that probably in the, um, the British invasions. You know, there, there probably is some 
thought towards this as at least an option for him to do in the future. Though again, events overtook him and the expedition in 55 probably isn't, you know, is a bit late, is not really on the strength he wanted. And then in 54, there are similar restrictions. But nevertheless, it's spectacularly celebrated with votes of thanksgiving back in Rome. Now, let's look a little bit more at the detail. Caesar always assumed the offensive. He defended only when absolutely essential. So for instance, when the Helvetii arrive and at first he's only got one legion, they fortify the bank of the river and they block the passes and they, you know, they try and stop the Helvetii and they do stop them coming through that way. Um, otherwise, it's, um, he's only waiting until the other five legions of his army arrives. Then he follows up and attacks. Um, sometimes he's forced to withdraw because of supplies or reverse, you know, before Bibracte, Bibracte, however you pronounce it, in 58, the big confrontation with the Helvetii, and after Gagovia in 52 BC. But in each case, he quickly resumes the offensive when opportunity offers. So, you know, he goes back and he attacks the Helvetii as soon as there's a slight change in circumstances. 52, yes, he retreats from Gagovia, but then he's steaming off towards Elysia and the final confrontation that will bring the war to that campaign to an end. And you know, you'll see this particularly in the um, cavalry in the, the Civil War. And you get that same reaction to rebellion. Um, you know, he gathers what's immediately available, uh, the troops and marches right at the heart of the rebellion. So when he relieves Quintus Cicero in early 53 BC, you know, he does have a small force, but he, he makes it look even smaller, tries to appear cautious to lull the tribes into attacking, and then he defeats them. But he goes at it very hard. You know, it's going to the center, it's not hanging around. He is often outnumbered, he's often poorly supplied. Now, various scholars in the 19th century, um, Delbruck and the others, you know, tended to see all Caesar's numbers are exaggerated. There were probably more Romans than there were Germans and Gauls in these armies. A lot of the logic doesn't really bear up um, because they always exaggerate the number of Romans and then do their best to diminish. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. Caesar claims he found records of the Helvetii recording their population and he counted the number that he sent back and therefore can calculate the casualties, maybe, but you know how many others escaped his men and got back on their own? How often when this vast army turns up outside Elysia to relieve Vercingetorix, you know, you wonder how many, whether the Gauls knew how many people they actually had. Um, but it does seem to be a large force. It makes sense only in that case. However, although he's often outnumbered, and although he does launch these offensives when he has limited supply, so he has to win quickly and can't have a prolonged period of maneuvering, what he tells us is that he's always gathered as many supplies as he possibly can, all that was available, and that if he'd waited any longer, nothing more would have arrived. He would not have got stronger in men or in material, and therefore, what's the point of waiting? So let's go straight at them. It's all about being very bold. It's about seizing the initiative. And this is typically Roman. You could see it in Lucullus and Pompey's campaigns, but also in imperial commanders. You know, think of the, the Jewish rebellion and responses there. When somebody rebels, the Romans march straight at what they could perceive to be the heart of the rebellion with whatever troops and supplies they could gather quickly. The emphasis is on as much speed as you can get. You wait only if waiting would give you more quickly. If it doesn't do that, whether it's Caesar crossing to um, Greece in the Civil War or, you know, heading off, then what's the point of waiting? You know, don't hang around unless there is a clear advantage that will come quickly, because otherwise it's much better to strike. And Roman tactics tend to be very aggressive. So is this rash? Now, let's look at a quote Suetonius tells us about some Augustus's sayings. So, Augustus thought nothing less becoming in a well-trained leader than haste and rashness, and accordingly, favourite sayings of his were, more haste, less speed, better a safe commander than a bold, and that is done quickly enough, which is done well enough. You know, hurry slowly, festine lente. Um, you know, better a safe commander than a good actually comes from a, a, a joke, you know, <laughs> a Greek play originally, where it's, it's meant to be ironic. If you look at the invasion of Britain, for instance, in 55 BC, Caesar talks about gathering as much information as he could about Britain, landing places, the British tribes, their politics, by talking to traders. Um, he doesn't actually find out very much. And, you know, Austin and Rankov in their wonderful book Exploratio are rather critical, saying, well, you know, he hasn't learned very much, but he goes anyway. There is nearly a disaster in each of the British expeditions. Um, 
each case caused by the weather. You know, Caesar draws his ships up onto the beach in best Mediterranean fashion, and they get smashed by storms and poor weather in the English Channel. This, to some extent, is someone who you know, just isn't familiar with the local sea conditions or rides his luck, thinks, well, the weather will hold for as long as I need it. It's less forgivable making exactly the same mistake in the second expedition, um, but they all manage to get back. There's enough craftsmen to repair enough of the ships. But it's risky, you know, and again, if he got stranded there with relatively small forces, what might have happened? However, again, you come back to this, the, the sort of the way the Romans would see it. If Caesar had waited in Gaul to try and get more information about Britain, there's no certainty whatsoever that he could have learnt any more. You know, he's sent a ship along the coast, they've looked, but unless you go inland, if you go inland, you're starting negotiations with people, um, you're giving warning. You know, he's basically decided to invade already. So it reaches a point where this is what I want to do. I've tried to learn more. I can't learn as much as I'd like, but there's no way of changing that. So let's just go and see what happens. So again, that's not untypical for a Roman commander. It might seem a little reckless, overbold by other standards, but this is very Roman. And all of those sayings by Augustus are not trying to say to Roman commanders, um, you've got to be very cautious, you know, don't go fishing with a golden hook, all this, I think another one of his expressions. But it's more about just tone it down a bit, lads. You know, don't go completely um, bull in a china shop, you know, and just charge at absolutely everything and always attack. It's trying to restrain what a Roman aristocrat would naturally do. Caesar is a reflection of their, their instincts. And at least Caesar has the ability, as you know, Kepi and others point out, well, okay, he gets himself into a mess, but he gets himself out of a mess as well. So it's not untypical. It wouldn't really be seen as rash or rasher by Rome than other Roman commanders, rash by Roman standards, at least at first. I mean, you could argue that as the civil war goes on, he gets more desperate. Um, you know, landing in Macedonia in January 48 BC is a big risk. Africa in early 46 wasn't prepared, didn't have sufficient transport to carry as many troops and supplies as he'd want. He's outnumbered, he's in serious danger of defeat until the reinforcements arrive, and it's, it's difficult for some of them to get through. There's the long delay, there's the concerns, hence the bit about him you know, getting in a boat and trying to sail back to Italy. Again, though, you know, you can, the, the logic is there in that if Caesar had waited on these occasions, his enemies would only go stronger, he would not grow any stronger. In on neither of those occasions was there any realistic prospect of him getting more transport ships to take more people in one go. So you're dealing with what you've got and saying, well, if I just wait, and the big problem he has in the Civil War, that there is only Caesar, really, on his side. When Pompey is defeated at Pharsalus and goes off and dies in Egypt, then other leaders appear and the war will continue in North Africa and later in Spain. If Caesar had been killed or badly defeated, that's probably it, because the war is just about his position and his prestige, and he doesn't have the, the, the sort of depth of his opponents. So there's an element where he has to keep on winning, and he has to keep on winning quickly because delays aren't going to help. The enemy have shown they're not going to negotiate. That's been clear from early on. He's tried that in the Italian campaign. They wouldn't negotiate with him when their position was stronger. They're, they, they're even less inclined to do it now. Their position is weaker. So there's an element where he couldn't gain. So it's probably fair to say that he does get a bit rash as the civil war goes on. Um, whereas Suetonius actually says he became more cautious, at least about risking battle in the later years, because he felt his luck was running out. He's probably impatient I suspect some form of certainly basic exhaustion, fatigue, maybe even combat fatigue. Bear in mind what I mentioned earlier, he's been fighting every year of his life for a long time. There has been no break and Caesar is very much rather like the Duke of Wellington, something of a one man band. There are only a few subordinates he will trust to any degree. He has to do a lot. He's built his success around being someone who intervenes at all levels and who is always there, always active. Now he's got great stamina, great energy, all this sort of thing, but there are limits to everybody. And there's also, he's got perhaps overconfident, you know, he's used to winning, his army certainly is, you know, he blames overconfidence for several of their misadventures, the, you know, 
pushing too far at Gagovia and all this sort of thing and elsewhere. You know, they think they can win whatever they do. And armies do get like that. You know, they will push on, they'll attack and to get a bit surprised when suddenly the enemy's fighting better or in a better position, they're actually exploiting it and they don't just automatically win. So all of those things are a factor within that. But within the context, this is not... It's something that probably jumps out to us more than it would to the Romans. So I think the rashness element is pushed too far by modern commentaries. By Roman standards, this would not be seen as anything like the vice that, that we tend to. And again, the Romans would come back and say, well, you know, he does keep winning, so you know, he's got to be doing something right. Politics and war, let's talk a little bit about these. You know, we often talk of domestic politics, there's the public thanksgivings, the euphoria at Rome after his British expeditions. You know, it's, this is the longest period of public thanksgiving ever awarded to any Roman commander, and he gets even more for defeating Vercingetorix. So these are spectacular. It's also important not to forget the, the politics of control in Gaul. You know, it's common for, for any imperialist. It, it's, this is how they tend to work. Think of Sir Arthur Wellesley, later the Duke of Wellington, when he was in India. They spend an awful lot of time talking to local leaders. And you, know, you can beat the enemy in battle, um, but the peace, the settlement, the occupation requires a political settlement. You need to make your presence and what you're doing acceptable to the locals so they don't keep on rebelling. This is particularly the case for Caesar because he's able to leave Gaul, take away almost all his army, and it doesn't explode into rebellion. Rome's allies don't get torn to pieces by the others who've done more poorly in his absence. You know, basically, you've got to convince the locals that it's better to accept the Romans and their presence or whatever empire it happens to be, rather than go back to war because the risks of war are greater and the advantages of peace are, you know, they're enough there. It, it, cost and balance basically decides in favor of, of accepting this. Now, Caesar often exploits the divisions between the tribes and within the tribes. He's very good at this and there's nothing new in this. Other Roman commanders would do much the same. Um, it's less emphasized. Uh, Caesar's clearly aware of this and you know there's at least one council per year with the chieftains of Gaul, gives them rewards, gives them power, some of them get citizenship. There are some failures, most notably 53 to 52 BC when there are widespread rebellions and Dio actually says that Vercingetorix had been favored by Julius Caesar in the past. Caesar doesn't mention that when I suppose you know he wouldn't if it was true and that there's a reasonable chance that it was. He does make mistakes. He does misjudge things. You know, the execution of a leader before the second British expedition uh, creates lots of bad blood, leads to um, the rebellions. You've got, again, it's a cost-benefit calculation on these local leaders. Many of them have seen the Romans' arrival as an opportunity. This will make me more powerful. I can use the Romans as a big, burly friend against the enemies over there, my neighbours I don't like, or the people in my own tribe who are my rivals. But after a few years, when you've got everything you feel that the Romans can give you, you've got prestige, you've got dominance within your tribe, over neighbouring tribes, maybe you start thinking, well, actually, now if the Romans weren't around, I could get even more. So... You know, don't forget the other side of the story. This is not just about Roman mistakes. This is also about the independent action of the leaders who are all ambitious leaders trying to do the best for themselves and in at least some cases for what they consider the best interest of their people as well. And that can significantly alter their attitude towards Caesar and the Romans in general. You know, he does conquer and assimilate a very large area in a short time, though again, you know, Roman physical presence is limited. The army comes in, you become allies of Rome, either because you've been beaten or because you've submitted in the first place, and that's it. You, you, know, you give levies of grain, perhaps of troops to the Romans, but you're not dealing with Roman merchants operate even more freely than they had before within your markets, but beyond that. There aren't a lot of rebellions afterwards. There's one by the Vale of Varchi, which is suppressed by Brutus, not Decimus Brutus, the other Brutus who will um, kill Caesar. But it's safe to leave Gaul with a very small garrison in 49 BC. Finally, let's just do Caesar in battle, because obviously that's a significant part of his leadership style. Obviously, the decision of when to fight is a big deal for commanders. We've talked about this and we've talked about strategy in the Punic Wars, but it's still true there. 
Caesar is bold and very offensive in strategic terms, but he's quite cautious when it comes to risking battle. He fights only when the conditions are favourable, and he's fond of surprise attack. You know, he does try to defeat the, the Helvetii by a, a night attack, doesn't work, but he doesn't, have, doesn't feel obliged to confront them in battle and do everything in the open and make it all glorious and spectacular. Uh, the Massacre of the Tigurini, that's done by surprise. Um, Usipete's Tank Terry, that's the bit where the ambiguity of, you know, this is during a truce, what's going on? Caesar just claims they broke it first. So he does like surprise and swift action, but again, doesn't do that all the time. If it fails, he doesn't rush into battle. There are days of manoeuvring, sometimes even longer. This is true in Gaul. It's also true in the Civil Wars. He doesn't just turn up and say, I'm going to fight. He doesn't like to fight with the grounds against him, so fighting up, up slope. He's actually surprised in the Battle of Zela in 46 when Farnaces breaks the rules and charges uphill against the Romans. And Caesar thinks that, well, shouldn't be doing that. That's not what normal people do. There are some blemishes. Um, there's a story that Thapsus begins um, without his permission. So here we've got this quote from, again, this is written by one of Caesar's officers who continued his commentaries because Caesar finishes when he get, reaches Alexandria or just afterwards. Caesar still hesitated, refused to be budged by their earlier insistence. He was bawling out constantly. He did not approve of engaging in battle by an impromptu sally and repeatedly checking the line from advancing when suddenly a trumpeter on the right wing, yielding to pressure from the troops and without Caesar's orders, began to sound the charge. This was taken up all by all the cohorts and they began to advance on the enemy. The centurions faced about and vainly attempted to restrain their men, urging them not to engage without their commander's orders. Caesar realized it was impossible to resist the troops' impetuosity. He gave the word, good luck, and set his horse at a gallop against the enemy front line. So the men want to fight, you can't hold them back. Okay, let's do it. So he's not always in full control. The army's impatient, the army wants the war over, and they're very competent. Uh, sorry, confident. And in the aftermath of this battle, you can see there's a lot of anger against the enemy. There's a massacre of Pompeians that's far more extensive than the usual attempts at Caesar to you know, extend his clemency and persuade people to join him rather than just kill them all. How to fight is once the battle has developed, and normally Caesar wants this battle to come on his own terms. Um, again, Sombers, ex the Battle of the Sabres, the Sombra perhaps, is exceptional, but he always keeps a very close eye on the fighting. That's, you know, very, very close. He's very mobile. Tends to start positioning himself on the right wing, usually where the tenth is stationed, the right traditionally being the place of honour in ancient armies that would then come on into the modern tradition where, you know, your grenadier company went on the right, your senior unit goes on the right of the line. Um, but would move as required. So let's. this is from a little bit later on. As Sanders' book, The General, sums up Roman command styles rather well. The duty of a general is to ride by the ranks on horseback, show himself to those in danger, praise the brave, threaten the cowardly, encourage the lazy, fill up gaps, transpose a unit if necessary, bring aid to the wearied, anticipate the crisis, the hour and the outcome. He does, however, you know, there are subordinates there. Caesar can't be everywhere at the same time. He's not committing himself to the fighting in the way Alexander would, which means you entirely trust your subordinates at every level to do the right thing because you're not going to be able to give them any orders. Um, Caesar tries to anticipate and be in the right place where he's most needed, but he can't always do that. So you have, for instance, in the battle against Ariovistus, Publius Crassus, who was in charge of the cavalry and better able to move about and see what was happening than those in the fighting line, spots the German threat to the Roman flank, orders up the third line to oppose them. So initiative is permitted. This is not an army rigidly under control. And we'll talk elsewhere about the role of tribunes and centurions in, in battle in the Roman army, because I think this is very often misunderstood. However, you know, this is fairly untypical, at least in Caesar's account, this is a rare exception and well done Publius Crassus, he did the right thing, but it shouldn't be necessary because usually Caesar has anticipated or has got to the right spot. But Labienus will do things as well, you know, generally speaking, trusted subordinates are allowed to do it and if they get, get it right, then they receive praise. And other commanders, Labienus will command in the same style of Caesar, so will other subordinates. And this is the pattern we see again and again in Roman armies. You move around, it's, you know, more like the Duke of Wellington than Napoleon, uh, particularly Napoleon in his later years as his armies get bigger. It's galloping around, trying to be in the right place. It's tinkering with the detail, you know, moving up 
taking charge, intervening, moving up reserves at quite a, a local level, as well as doing the grand sweep and committing more major reserves, whole lines, these sort of formations. Being there, being seen as well. You notice at Waterloo, virtually everybody on the Allied side claims to have seen Wellington at some point. They probably did. Um, you can inspire, you can um, encourage, you can do the little details, you can change formations, give orders, manage the battle in the way that we see at the Sombra and elsewhere. So Caesar presents himself not as different in the way he commands to other Roman commanders, but entirely within Roman doctrine as this is how a Roman commander should behave. This is the tradition. This is how a senator who's been elected or appointed and put in charge of an army, this is how he should act, how he should control them, how he should inspire them, how he should win. So he presents himself at better at everything, whether it's the inspiration, whether it's being the battlefield manager, and you know, there's great emphasis on how he rewards, but also punishes on occasions. He doesn't use the stick as much as the carrot, but nevertheless, it's there. It's part of the system. Other commanders were seen as much more martinets, more likely to punish, but Caesar encourages the men to do their best. There's even, it takes it to an extreme in the African war where it's a sort of emphasis on just how really great Caesar is at everything, where he does something unusual in that there is fighting between the outposts and the army, the forces that are covering the army's camp. And Caesar did not go up onto the rampart and personally supervise the execution of these orders. With his remarkable skill and expertise in warfare, he remained in his tent and issued orders through scouts and messengers. So that's the point where he can decide, I know what's going on, I can simply issue orders, I don't have to see it, this is a minor thing, I, it's all under control, I know what I'm doing, my men know what I'm doing. And it's, you know, it comes back to the, the comment at the end of the song, you're supposed to take a brief breath and say, what a guy. Um, Again, all of these accounts, this one written by one of Caesar's supporters after Caesar's death, they're very favourable, they're very flattering. The conclusion is this, in both those and in particular in Caesar's own version with his dispassionate third person narrative and also he doesn't talk a lot about where he is and what he's doing. These tend to be incidental comments that we have to pick up. He doesn't just present himself as a great commander, but specifically as a great Roman commander, because he's dealing with this contemporary audience. He wants to present to them, I'm the best thing you could wish for in a military commander and a, and a governor, so therefore vote to me. Um, that he's able to describe this so well, so fluently, makes him again unlike any of his predecessors. Political problems were there, having spent so much time on campaign, as with many other aspects of his career, you know, there's a warning for future generals that by the time he's dealing with the Senate in the aftermath of the Civil War, he does tend to lack patience. He's probably got used to being in command at this point, which may be a disadvantage. But in the end, you come back to the point raised by Pliny and others. Whatever, from a Roman perspective or otherwise, you think of what Caesar did and why he did it, how he did it was extremely efficient. And if he wasn't perfect, as you know, many commentators have pointed out, if he makes mistakes, again, we know about those mistakes through his own narrative. He described it that way. He solved the problem. He dealt with everything. Caesar's luck, Caesar's talent, Caesar's charisma and boldness paid off again and again and again. And if he lost a couple of battles, it's really, you know, Gagovia is a, is a repulse, a failure. Um, Dihachium is a failure. He has to retreat from that. Um, but otherwise you've got the defeat of Cotter and Sabinus where he's responsible because it's his army but he's not actually present and you know, interestingly there he presents the two of them as the contrast of the good Roman commander and the bad Roman commander but Caesar presents himself and others see Caesar as the great commander and even later criticism in Roman sources is not about his talent militarily even if people were less, less favourable in his political ambition, his impact on the state so there we are, Ides of March has come but not gone, and here's a talk about Caesar the General. So I hope that was of interest, and next time I think we're going back to a video about a movie, and then we'll see, we'll probably be back to the Conquer of the Proud after that. So hopefully um, see you all then. Right, bye.